In addition to the growing understanding of what characterizes an effective negotiator, there is a growing recognition of what constitutes a successful negotiation, criteria to gauge and evaluate a negotiation, to determine whether or not both parties felt the negotiation was beneficial, and whether or not a positive foundation has been built for future negotiations. Hank Calero has done extensive research on this question and has established benchmarks to measure the success of a negotiation. I asked him to share these benchmarks with us and how they would be useful to negotiators. Hank, how would you characterize a successful negotiation? Are there any criteria that you use? Well, uh, Ed, we, we think of some benchmarks that we can use. We can go back when, when our negotiations all over and said and done with uh, to go through critiquing. You'll find out whether it's really as stable and as worthwhile as, or as lasting as you think or as profitable or successful. Well, let's say is it successful. What, what are the benchmarks for a successful negotiation? Probably the first uh, that we find is that people that negotiate, and this is for both parties, just not one side, both people feel that it was worthwhile. That is, the whole time consumed was worthwhile. It wasn't just an exercise. Then sometimes the another bench, very important benchmark is that both individuals feel that they got something out of it. They got something out of it, worthwhile. Oftentimes, that the getting something out of it is not necessarily in a monetary sense because uh, mm -hmm. many successful negotiations are where one deals with agreements in principle. And all you do is talk about agreements in principle, but don't nail any one specific thing down. That'll come downstream at some other time. So they got something out of it that was worthwhile. Uh, another important factor is that when individuals have gotten something, that is in a, in a monetary get form or terms and conditions get form, they always feel that maybe they could have gotten a little bit more. You leave the negotiating table feeling that you left something and you took something, but uh, another benchmark of a successful negotiation so is... there's always a feeling of a little bit of dissatisfaction? Dissatisfaction to the extent, yes, you could have gotten a little bit more, and yet you're satisfied with what you got. Sure, isn't it? Or as the expression says, you're still a little hungry, and that's good. Uh -huh. and so both, this, again, is both parties, not just one. And uh, another very important benchmark that individuals uh, have to have is they, they have to have their self-respect intact. They have to leave the negotiating table still having that self-respect uh, intact. That nothing, despite the, the conflict, despite the, uh, the amount of intimidation that took place, the amount of harassment or whatever, they left the negotiating table with their self-respect intact, both parties. They got to have that. And another factor is that both parties feel that they achieved the majority of their objectives. Now, some, for years, it's been difficult for me to understand how two parties can go into a negotiation and have it be successful by both achieving the majority of their negotiations. You know, this seems contradiction. Since how can you get 60, both parties get 60% of it or 100%, and so that seems in contradiction. But in, in these years of researching the process, I find out that it's not in contradiction. You see, because when we go into negotiate, we have what we call get objectives. Get mm -hmm. objectives usually are dollars, percentages, terms and conditions, and prove objectives, where you're out to prove something to the other person, which have, don't have the monetary aspects. And both parties go to the negotiation with prove objectives that differ. And oftentimes I can prove something to you, for example, that's not going to cause you any money and not cause you any concern and really not being important to you. And you say, all right, so have your little ego trip or whatever and you all will likewise do to me. Hank, is this similar to what is commonly called a win-win negotiation? That both parties feel that the negotiation resulted in something more than a compromise settlement? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, as all, it's exactly the win-win. The different here, the only addition to the win-win here is the win-win is not only in the monetary sense, getting something, but also proving something. So yeah. winning, winning a point, if you will, rather than winning a uh, percentages or dollars. So the, another factor is that uh, both parties have to feel that they have achieved the majority of their objectives. Another, another very important thing in this, no matter how skillful a person is, no matter how experienced they are, people have to leave a negotiation with a feeling that they, they learn something from each other. Mm -hmm. I find negotiators, are, successful negotiators are great students. They learn from each other. They're always picking up. They're always uh, 
developing. What types of things uh, you mentioned? Well, uh, the things we learn are the things we learn to do or do better, and sometimes the things we learn not to do. You mean about the negotiating process? Yeah, exactly, and the other individual. So, and then it all gets categorized and cataloged. And <laughs> Another important thing is uh, when a successful negotiations, a benchmark is that both individuals oftentimes feel they wouldn't mind negotiating with each other again. I mean, mm -hmm. despite, uh, despite whatever took place, they both feel that the guy wasn't all that bad. I wouldn't mind dealing with him again. It's recognizing the importance of developing a foundation for future negotiations. Exactly, yes. Because, of course, negotiation is, a, is, is circular in nature, not linear. And it doesn't have, you, mm -hmm. you, just, you don't just go to negotiate one person, that's it. In most cases, you negotiate with them again and again. And then lastly, uh, negotiations don't end when you sign a contract or shake hands. That oftentimes that's when you start, they start. Because that's, that's when you have to live with the conditions. Ed, one other uh, benchmark that individuals have in successful negotiations is they, they seem to be able to come up with creative alternatives. That is, they say that somehow they, in, the, in the course of their negotiation they got bogged down, they were at an impasse, they didn't seem to. They seemed to, didn't seem to know which direction to go, and one of them sparked the other with some sort of idea, concept, and then the other picked up on it, and they were they interacted, and as a result, they were creative in coming up. And so, another good benchmark is that people are creative in coming up with options. Hank, what factors create a conducive environment for creativity in negotiations? If the environment that that um, seems to be most conducive to creativity is when individuals don't automatically uh, reject ideas or options or alternatives. Uh, instead of rejecting them, they, they massage them. That is, they massage them by asking questions like, well, how would it work, and when could we put it in effect, and why should I do it, and on and so forth, and use, the, use those, uh, those questions. And in and, and so doing, see some benefits to the idea rather than, a, than an absurd approach. And then the other aspect is, not since creativity isn't uh, the source of one person, but is universal, that when the one person that drops the idea, when you force him to massage it, he sometimes comes up with a better idea. Or sometimes the person that's doing the massaging or asking the questions builds on the original idea. What do you think are some of the major barriers to creativity in the negotiation process? Oh, by far is our educational process. Our educational process which structures us in a vertical scale of thinking. So we attempt to solve problems logically. And that's what we call vertical thinking. When and certainly then vertical thinking has a strong application in many situations, but in others they don't. Well, let me give you some good examples. <laughs> Moshe Dayan recently was talking to the Israeli parliament, and he said uh, to them, gentlemen, we have to get the Israeli Arab peace talks going. And he said, I offer uh, as, as a possibility three alternatives. Now notice as, he, as, he, as I uh, reiterate these uh, alternatives, Two of them are vertical and one is lateral, to give you an illustration. So first, he said, uh, our first alternative is to get a Geneva Peace Conference going, sponsored, co-sponsored by the U.S. and the USSR and, and the United Nations. Now, that's a vertical approach. Very Isn't logical. It? Sure, very logical. The second approach, also logical, he said we should get an, a foreign mediator, like we did in 1949 dispute, that you remember Dr. Mm -hmm. Bunch held, mm -hmm. handled so well. And that's also vertical. And then he said, our third alternative, he said, let's have a proximity negotiation. Now, when I read the article, I thought, what the what hell, the hell is, is, a, is a proximity negotiation? I've never heard any such term, and I suspect few negotiators have. Well, he explained what he meant by a proximity negotiation. It was a very creative idea. He said, thinking laterally, we'll have the Israelis and the Arabs meet in Geneva in the same hotel, only they'll share different floors. They won't confront, they won't face each other face to face. They'll, they'll set up lines of communication in the same hotel, different floors. Now, can you imagine the creative possibilities that might ensue? <laughs> you know, they have to use common elevators. They might meet in the elevators. They might start a discussion in the elevators. One might say, well, you know, um, Moshe, I saw you going down yesterday. How about you see me coming up today? And, and if they talk in elevators, they might talk in the hallways. If they talk in the hallways, they might go into a room. If they go into a room, they might sit down, and all you got them to do. That's what I mean. 
Why is it in the, in the informal process of negotiations, like the proverbial drink in the bar, why do they often create such uh, hospitable environments for create creative solutions to uh, negotiations and uh, conflicts that arise in negotiations? Uh, one of the factors we find is that when you when you meet people informally, they get the feeling that whatever you're going to talk in the, t the realm of business is going to be basically agreements and principle, not settlements. So uh, agreements and pre principle make people much more comfortable than when you try to nail them down to sign on the dotted line. Can you give me an example of the difference between a principle and an actual settlement? Well, an agreement or principle is, um, well, for example, the, is the Israelis and, and the Arabs are attempting to agree in principle as to what position they're going to have with the pa Palestinian question, or whether they should even sit down. The, the Americans and the Russians are agree trying to agree in principle with regards to the, 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 the weapons race and the salt talk uh, concepts, and without any details. So I guess another way of simplifying it is agreements in principle are rather abstract <laughs> agreements. Uh, uh, settlements are the specifics, the bottom line factors. That's And again, in an informal situation like mm -hmm. you just mentioned, the cocktail bar, people don't mind sitting down and talking in, in general agreements in principle. There seems to be a clarification of values, which may be another term for principles, as they get to know each other on an informal basis, and, and that leads to the development of trust. Yes, and, th and those dynamics, what, what we see taking place is that all of a sudden, two individuals, A and B, thinking they had varying differs, different principles, now start realizing that they're one and the same. What the problems were, that they were using labels, different labels, not namely words, because words are only labels. And when they started using these labels, they, they realized the meaning was exactly the same, so sometime that works out. The negotiators also get away from many external constraints in an informal setting. They don't have to play to the needs of an audience or an organization or a constituency they represent. They're less structured. Less structured, yeah. yes. by all means. Yeah. So in addition then to, to some of the things that I just talked about, uh, benchmarks, there are a couple more that might be worthwhile touching on. Uh, this is the element of time. You know, negotiations end when they end, mm -hmm. whenever that is. And it's interesting that looking back on some of the benchmarks of successful negotiations, that the in negotiators always feel that it could, have t it could have taken less time. And that's a healthy note, to know that it could have taken less time. It didn't take less, and maybe it won't the next time, but it, you think it could have. You see areas where you could have improved it. Okay, so there's a look towards the future then. Yes, absolutely. And uh, it's also, as we talked earlier about a dissatisfaction about not having gotten enough, mm -hmm. it's a healthy sign. And then, can, then one additional, maybe possibly, to summarize this whole thing of benchmarks on successful negotiation, because this has to be present. You know, an individual can have a successful negotiation, as he sees it, without some of these benchmarks that I just discussed. But the last one is when the one I call the absolute must. This has to be there. Because if, if a person doesn't have this, you really should question whether you think you've had a successful negotiation, and that is the, sa the agreement or settlement has to be stable. That is, you have to have to leave the, with the feeling that the people are going to do what they promised to do, what they agreed to do, and carry it out. Mm. And if you don't have that feeling, then you, I don't think you've had, <laughs> had even despite how what you've talked to yourself, I don't think you've got to have a very successful session. Hank, you mentioned before that these benchmarks of a successful negotiation aren't often considered by negotiators. No. Um, in 12 years of doing research in, in the area of negotiations, uh, I only, it was a, the fact that it would prompt me to, th to think about this, and uh, it was on a trip back from London recently when I was sitting next to a gentleman uh, who, when we found out what each, each one was doing, and uh, turned to me and said, well, what is a successful negotiation? He said, what, how do I gauge it? How do I monitor it? And up until now, people, uh, rightly so, have been more interested in how to negotiate successfully, how to negotiate more successfully, rather than what constitutes a successful negotiation. Why don't negotiators ask themselves these questions or reflect on these benchmarks? Well, because question. negotiators are very pragmatic, very pragmatic. They're more interested in how. How do I do something? And what else can I do? Rather than what have I done? Mm. And that's that what have I done is what led me into this research. You see, because that is, a, as I mentioned to you earlier, I spent a number of years negotiating in industry and variety of situations and business. 
And what prompted me to get into this negotiation was when I woke up one morning after some 17 years of negotiating, realizing I didn't know what the hell I was doing, although I had no fear of doing it. The what, say, what was I doing? It never even entered my mind. I just did it. I mean, I was like Louis Armstrong. When he was asked to, to describe jazz, he said, if you don't feel it, forget it. Negotiators are increasingly recognizing that there are certain rules of the game or rituals that are followed in negotiations. And they are careful to follow these rules because they realize that if these established patterns or ways of doing business with other negotiators are not followed, they risk damaging their credibility and leverage. In the following interview, Hank Calero gives us his insights on the rituals of negotiations and their importance for building cooperation and support to help keep us on target during a negotiation and to reduce the possibility of being confused or sidetracked as the issues are brought out, discussed, and resolved. Hank, you've mentioned that there are certain rituals or rules of the game that are followed by negotiators. What are these rituals and why are they important? Well, the what we look at as rituals, it is that the negotiating process takes some steps. And in these steps, they tend to be somewhat formalized. And oftentimes, the inexperienced negotiator jumps over these steps. And by jumping over these steps, he's going to have to deal with those steps later on. And if he has to deal with them later on, they turn, tend to be very difficult. And they tend to disrupt the process. So that's that's what we mean by the ritual. So specifically, let me mention and touch on what the steps are. They look. I'll go through them very quickly. The first phase of, of this ritual, I guess we could be called a, a, a social amenities phase, or where you set the climate and the environment. And you greet each other, and you go through all the palaver that one does. Uh, how was the trip? Would you like some coffee? And a little bit of that goes a long way. And then from there, you, you're still in the same first phase, in the first five minutes, first five minutes phase. You, someone generally then has to go through an introduction. And a lot of times, sometimes I find negotiators completely forget introducing people or their functions and assume that individuals know each other. And then an hour later, they say, well, what was your name, Ed? And what function were you involved in here? you're in an area that's disrupting the negotiations when you should have already taken care of it. So introductions. And then the next thing that happens is one individual from either negotiating team goes through what we call a general overview. The general overview usually consists of stating why, why you're there, what, how you perceive the meeting or what the objectives are. And you keep it at a very high level of abstraction. And another thing that some negotiators don't know is that the first person to speak has a great responsibility because what he says and how he says it has a great bearing on the negotiation. Of the sets other. the whole tone of the negotiation. He does, very, very strongly. So you have to be careful what you, what you say and how you say it. And, as that, and my, our recommendations is that uh, the individuals should try and keep that general overview to a minute or less. And also another no-no is when you do keep the, that general overview to a minute or less, don't defer to someone in your own team. You've given the general overview, and then you turn and say, Ed, uh, would you explain that exactly how that shapes up? And, and no, wait for the other person to respond. You've got to get their initial input uh, as to how they feel. So you, you get, you've got the, the um, social amenities, the, you've got the introductions, you've got the general overview. Then comes the next part of the ritual, which is very important, very, very important. And that's the phase we call background music. Someone background starts saying background music. Someone says, six months ago, Ed, you asked us to bid on this particular project, and as a result of that, we submitted blah, 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 blah. And you go to whatever background music was to you. And then you, you respond with your background music. Uh -huh. Those are the basic then ritualistic dynamics, if you will. These initial phases involve a lot of getting acquainted, building a sense of trust, learning a little bit about the background of the issues, where the other party is coming from, kind of feeling each other out. Yes, some negotiators say you got to feel the water, you got to test the climate, you got to you got to feel each other out. Someone said it's a mating dance. 
Uh-huh. Well, see, it really is. But isn't mating dance sure. a ritual? Sure. Oh, definitely. All right. <laughs> Let me tell you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now we're still, you know, raising the feathers and going, doing That's the cluck right. clucks and sure. uh, and everything's fine and so far. And so now we've, if we've managed to handle this part of the ritual well enough and not been getting any real hang-ups or any real conflicts, because that's downstream. Next comes what we call the issue definition phase, because someone's got to now lay out the issues as they see it, individually or mutually, whatever the case. And as we see it today, the reason we're negotiating uh, is to discuss the total cost of this project and progress payments and, and on and on and on. One of the things I recommended at this phase that many negotiators' mistakes they make is when you define the issues, make sure you space the issues so that you can see how the other person reacts to what you've, you've stated. I, I give you an example. Mm. If I say, as I see, one of the issues is the cost of this project. If that cost is dear to you or important to you, it's a major issue to you, chances are that your blink rate will change when mm -hmm. I touch on that subject. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I also say, and another issue is progress payments, which is not a big issue to you because you expect to make progress payments, your blink rate will not, will not alter the rate of change. Therefore, if I know this, and I, I'm stating the issues, and I look at your eyes, your eyes give me immediate feedback as to whether that issue that I'm talking of is important to you or not. So we, we not only should, um, should go through the issue definition phase where you lay them out, but as you lay them out, get immediate nonverbal feedback from the other person, and the blink rate is a good one. Mm -hmm. People normally blink between four and eight blinks a minute when they're comfortable. So for those that are curious as to what's a fast blink rate, anything over eight is fast. Unless the person wears contact lenses, then they're usually eight to 12. <laughs> but don't worry, because most people with blink rate will change up to 20 and 30 when you touch on something that's important to them. When people are uncomfortable, their blink rate increases dramatically. That's amazing. It's oh. quite a change. The, you know, in London recently, uh, one gentleman stood up and he said, well, Mr. Calero, what you're telling us is nothing new. We've known about it here for years. That's what we call, that's where the expression blinking liar comes from. So now in the ritual, we, we to this definition phase, now comes in the issue selection phase. Okay, Hank, let me check this out. During the issue definition phase, all the issues are defined, and you've indicated it's important that a negotiator get feedback on how the other party reacts to your proposals. Now, in the issue selection and discussion phase, one issue is selected, and the negotiators present and discuss their positions on this one issue. Do you have any ground rules for which issues should be selected and discussed first? Should they be the most crucial ones or perhaps the least important? It depends on situations. We, we find most often that it's better to start with mi minor issues and put them to bed or get agreements and principles settled before you go on to tougher ones rather than the tough ones first, because oftentimes you get the greater resistance there, and the minor ones don't go down as easy later on. But again, that's, that's our preference, and it may not necessarily work in all situations. And so you go to the issue selection phase, and then you get into the conflict. That's the part of the ritual where we spend the most time, conflict. And that's a lovely sound to a Californian, isn't it? <laughs> to hear thunder right. in the background, because it's been so dry. I, I certainly hope that something follows that. <laughs> Hank, during the conflict phase, each side spends time defending their positions, debating with each other, and trying to win their arguments. What's the next phase in these rituals? The issue selection phase leads into conflict, where we spend most of our time. And the next part of that ritual then, if it comes about, sometimes it doesn't, is what we call the fallback compromise phase, where people fall back, parties fall back. And if you've got the fallback compromise phase, then the last step is obviously uh, arrived at. That's the agreement and principle settlement phase. Now, the, the ritual acts like a yo-yo. It's literally a yo-yo yo -yo function. Because if you start, visualize a yo-yo, I wish I had a yo-yo here to demonstrate this. But if you have a yo-yo and you wind it up and you let it go down, it goes down to its, its last extension, then comes back up. It doesn't come all the way up. It can come up halfway and then goes back down and goes back up. And that's what happens if you take one issue through the whole ritual, through all those steps. When you finally put that issue to bed or you get an agreement, principle, and settlement, then the yo-yo comes back up 
and you select another issue, and then you attempt to massage it through the conflict, fall back, compromise, settlement, agree, and then back up to the next one. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't go way back up to the top, do you, and reintroduce each other. You don't go back up and give the general overview as to why you're there. You don't go back up and go through background music. However, that you see the danger. Many people don't touch on those points beforehand, and then they get them, put them in, in a wrong order and they tend to be distractive forces rather than positive forces. And you create that, you create, create that environment, and, you, and whatever support or cooperation you're going to get, you're going to get it right off the bat, or you're not going to get it at all. That's the whole point. It's very difficult to change people downstream. Hank, what you've suggested to me is that it would be helpful to negotiators to use these rituals of negotiation and the criteria for a successful negotiation which we talked about earlier, as ways of reflecting on our experiences in negotiations and learning from them. Absolutely, because it's vital to our well-being. Uh, there are five negotiations we have every day, and if we don't negotiate these effectively, we don't live 24 hours. And just to touch on real quickly, the one is negotiating with people. We constantly negotiate with them, at home, in the office, wherever. You, we negotiate uh, with, in a cybernetic sense with a man-machine relationship. Uh, just anybody that doesn't negotiate effectively in the car doesn't live for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, we negotiate with non-humans. And as you know, I have a couple of few love, uh, German short hair pointers and I have to negotiate <laughs> with. So cats and dogs, horses. And, and thirdly, we negotiate uh, in, in, with, with nature. And that's a negotiation we have to carry out pretty well, otherwise we, we, won't, we, won't, we won't survive. And then the last one is... Uh, the toughest negotiation is you negotiate with yourself. So, in, so indeed, we have to understand these. By negotiating with yourself, that's really fascinating, Hank. You're talking about I intrapersonal conflicts that we have within us, different needs, different values, pulling in different directions. Yes. I was reading in the Los Angeles Times just recently where the word negotiation was used in conjunction with suicide. It said that the gentleman was very distressed over financial matters and he was unable to negotiate his inner conflict, so he took his life.